Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 112, Dr. Joseph Jedwab on Divine Omnipresence, Part 2. Dr. Joseph Jedwab is a professor of philosophy at Kutztown University in Pennsylvania. After earning his bachelor's degree in philosophy and theology at King's College London, he earned his master's and Ph.D. in philosophical theology from Oxford University. He's also been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Notre Dame. He's published several articles in analytic theology and metaphysics, and he blogs occasionally at trinities.org. I'm really glad to have him here today to talk with us about his article, God's Omnipresence, a Defense of the Classical View, which is forthcoming in the European Journal for Philosophy of Religion. Dr. Jedwab, welcome back to the Trinity's Podcast. It's good to be back. Dr. Jedwab, the subtitle of your article is A Defense of the Classical View. So what is the classical way to understand God's omnipresence? Well, there's some controversy over what the classical view is. I think I follow the mainstream in thinking that the classical view among Christians, those that hold classical theism and are also Christian theists, that view is that God is strictly and literally aspatial, spaceless, outside of space, but in a looser sense, God is omnipresent or everywhere. So it's that combination of views that I call the classical view. There is some controversy because, so I understand, there's an attempt to understand the medievals and some of the early modern philosophers as thinking that God is strictly and literally everywhere, not temporal, but still omnispatial. I haven't looked into that historical controversy a great deal, but uh, well, it's relevant to the paper. So when we describe the view as classical, we're not talking classical necessarily as in ancient, but classical as in very popular with mainstream Christianity since at least, what, the high Middle Ages? Or do you trace it back to Plotinus, Plato, and the early theologians that were so influenced by kind of general Platonism? I think this classical theism does predate Christian theism. So it does go back to ancient Greek philosophy. And people like Augustine, Boethius, Anselm took on board some of that classical theism, but they adapted it and made use of it for their own purposes when it came to their Christian faith. I could mention some of the central figures here, like um, Augustine and, and Boethius, who talk about Aristotle's categories. Aristotle had views about what could be said about something, and he divided those up into ten. The first is called substance, and the other nine are called accidental. But one of those is where or place. And both Augustine and Boethius say that when it comes to God, those apply only metaphorically. And yet in other places, they're happy to say that God is, in some sense, omnipresent. So the way that I put those two views together is that they want to say that God is, strictly speaking, aspatial, but in a looser sense, omnipresent. So, Dr. Jedwab, you distinguish stricter and looser ways of speaking or ways of talking about God. But then again, you might take them to be planting their flag on spatiality not literally applying to God. And so then they would just be saying that God is non-literally or metaphorically everywhere. It's as if God is everywhere. So you see these two statements in them that apparently are inconsistent. They say that the concept of space doesn't literally apply to God, but then they go on to say that God is everywhere. And you say, well, they must be talking about speaking strictly versus speaking loosely or maybe speaking more properly or less properly. But one might read them this way, just say they're planting their flag in the idea that spatiality doesn't apply to God, literally, 
And so when they say that God is everywhere, they must mean that non-literally. It's just as if God is everywhere. What they'd be saying is that God presumably is similar in some respects to, you know, like a maximally large object, which fills space, but only like that, that he's not literally in any space at all, such as being able to affect any portion, just like a, a uh, maximally large blob, I don't know, that filled all of space, that, like a big physical rock or something. It has causal effects everywhere. Well, God has causal effects everywhere. So you could sort of use the metaphor that God is everywhere, but it's, it's really just metaphorical. That would be one version of the view that I wish to defend. I simply don't want to commit as to whether the loose sense in which God is omnipresent is a metaphorical one. It could be literal, but still not strict. Let me give you some examples, see what you think. This kind of example goes back to Aristotle and was taken up by Aquinas, let me use my own version of it. A cat is the kind of thing that can be healthy or unhealthy in the strict sense. But you can also talk about cat food as being healthy or unhealthy. What we mean, I think, when we say that cat food is healthy is that it's the kind of food that if a cat has that diet, they will be a healthy cat. I don't think that we want to necessarily say that cat food is healthy in some metaphorical sense. I'd be content to say that's a literal sense, but maybe an analogical sense. So saying that cat food is healthy is not to compare the cat food to some healthy being. It's rather to say that this is the kind of thing which, if a cat eats it, will cause a cat to be healthy. Right. So... It literally bears a causal relationship to a thing which is healthy, strictly speaking. Right. But here's one qualification. You might even think that there could be healthy cat food in the absence of cats. So it wouldn't have to literally bear some relation to some healthy cats for it to be healthy cat food. Right, yeah, it seems like a counterfactual relation would be enough. If there's a nuclear holocaust and I, I go to the grocery store and there's a million cans of Fancy Feast there, I say, oh, it's a shame, I got all this healthy cat food, but no cats. But it's still healthy cat food. It's the kind of thing that would cause a cat to be healthy if a cat were to ingest it. That's right, though that is a very sad world to think about. Indeed. Anyway, I'm not sure Fancy Feast is healthy. But... <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bunch of goop and uh, byproducts. So, Dr. Jedwab, in many ways, you're following up on the work of the very famous medieval theologian slash philosopher, St. Thomas Aquinas. Can you tell us just very briefly who he is, why philosophers think he's important, and then what he says about divine omnipresence? It's hard to know where to start answering a question like, who is Thomas Aquinas and why is he important today? He's the guy all the colleges are named after. He's a towering figure. He is a great example of a Christian philosopher of his time. 13th century Dominican was responsible for bringing a lot of Aristotelian ideas into Christian theology. A doctor of the Catholic Church who is looked to still as the standard for what theology is and should be and wrote a great deal. In fact, he wrote so much that a lot of it is still untranslated. But the stuff that we do have in translation has been uh, more than ample for answering all kinds of questions that we might have even today. I don't know. It's hard to know where to stop talking about Thomas Aquinas. But let me say something about his view on omnipresence. So he must talk about this in more than one place, but I think of the, the Summa Theologiae, as a place to start. He has a treatise on God where he goes through 
various divine attributes, including God's omnipresence. And he's following a saying of Gregory the Great here when he says that God is everywhere by essence, power, and presence. And he tries to give some analysis of what it is to say that God is everywhere in each of those ways. So he says that God is everywhere by essence in that God is in all things because God creates and sustains all things. And God is everywhere by power in that all things are subject to God's power. And that would be because God is omnipotent. And finally, God is everywhere by presence in that God knows all things. And that would, of course, go back to God's being omniscient. So in each of those ways, Aquinas says that God is everywhere. Now, I think that he's not saying that God is strictly and literally everywhere, but only in an analogical sense, everywhere, where that's still a literal sense, but not a strict one. Do you recall that he explicitly connects these topics? I have read some of what he says about analogy, but I don't, I don't remember if he brings up analogy and an analogical predication in the context of omnipresence. It's not something that he says explicitly. It's just going from the idea that any positive predication of God is analogical. Right. He says that near the start of the Summa. And I would have thought that God's omnipresence uh, would have been something you say about God that's both intrinsic and positive. Right. So that's what I think Aquinas actually thinks about omnipresence, that God is strictly aspatial, but in some loose sense, in this case, an analogical sense, omnipresent. I see him as just following the classical Christian theistic tradition there. But suppose that someone wanted to think of each of these ways as being a way in which God is strictly and literally everywhere. Then I think there are problems. So let's go through them in turn. Suppose God is everywhere then in the strict sense, because God knows every truth about every place. And if you know every truth about every place, then you're there. Let's make a qualification. Maybe knowing isn't enough, but directly knowing would be enough to place you at the location. So we could say, well, God knows everything because God is omniscient. So clearly he would know every truth about every place. What would we mean by direct knowledge? Well, there are different ways you could take that. You might know something directly if you don't infer it from something. You might know it directly if you didn't hear it from anyone else. So God doesn't know of places from the testimony of another person. He knows it directly in that sense. Mm -hmm. And there's a third way you might think about it, that God knows these things because of some causal relation he stands in, either because he directly causes the place or because the place being the way it is causes God to know directly what it's like. So in each of these ways, we can think of God's knowledge of the place as being direct. Now, I just don't see why, and this is going to be a pattern that repeats itself as we look through each of these concrete proposals, I just don't see why having non-inferential knowledge about a place implies that you are at that place, or why directly knowing of a place because you didn't hear it from another person, you didn't have the testimony of another person, why that would mean that you have to be at that place. The causal way is more interesting, and uh, that gets picked up in some of the other suggestions that we can look at. 
might as well go on to the second idea of how it is that God is everywhere. You might think God is everywhere because God directly causes every place to exist. And if you directly cause some place to exist, then you have to be there. You have to be located there. Mm -hmm. I think those people who want to interpret the medievals more generally, and Aquinas specifically, as saying that God is strictly and literally everywhere, look to this principle to secure that end. It's because God is an agent who has a certain effect, and that agent, when it has a direct effect, has to be where that effect occurs. There's a principle that people appeal to. Spirit, and God is a spirit, spirit is present where spirit acts. So if you have an act that has a certain effect in a place, then the agent, the spirit who is acting, would have to be there at that place. They're rejecting action at a spatial distance. Right. And my own view is that even if that's not something that's consistent with the laws of nature, maybe the laws of nature rule out action at a distance. I certainly don't think that's a metaphysical impossibility. And there have been historical examples of scientists, including Newton, who thought that there could be action at a distance. That seems to me some evidence in favor of the view that this is at least metaphysically possible, even if it's not possible in some narrower sense, being consistent with the laws of nature or something like that. Your basic point is, well, it doesn't seem absolutely impossible to me, so then I don't imagine that an omnipotent being is going to be incapable of it, that is, action at a spatial distance. Right. Not only that, I think that God can be completely aspatial and still have a direct causal effect on places. God doesn't have to be there where he's acting. The last proposal that God is strictly and literally everywhere because God has the power directly to cause every place. Even if he, per impossible, didn't cause that place, he would still have the power to do so. That goes back to what I said before. I mean, if it's possible for something to act at a distance, then it can have the power to act at a distance and not be there. So something can directly cause something at another place Equally, it can have the power to cause something at another place, even if it's not there. Dr. Jedwab. Thomas Aquinas famously says that God is being itself, and one might think that that made God literally omnipresent if God is the being of all things. What's your view about that saying of Aquinas? Well, I'm not sure I entirely understand it. I'm not sure what I think about it. He wasn't the first to say it. Augustine before him said something very similar. They were thinking, presumably, about a Platonic view where there are these forms. There's the form of being itself, which is the best example of something that is. And all other things that have being, all other things that are, they are because they participate in being itself. And it's not exactly clear what participation involves, but one way you might think about it is that a being itself causes all other things to be like itself in a certain respect, namely that they are. So Augustine and Aquinas say that we shouldn't think of this form as Plato did, as being something distinct from God, but rather identify that form with God himself. God is the perfect being, the greatest being, and the greatest being would be identical with all of these forms like being greatness itself, being being itself, and other things like that. So in this early Christian theology, God comes to play the role that used to be played by some of these Platonic forms. Right. So what I think about that is, again, suppose that that's right. 
Suppose God is being itself and everything else participates in being. But again, why does that mean that God is strictly and literally in every place? If we can have action at a distance, if we can have something directly cause some place without being at that place, then I, again, I don't see why it wouldn't be that God can be being itself and cause every place, which also is and so has being, but not be at that place. This is the view of universals called transcendental universals. It's supposed to be that these are universals that exist outside of space and time. So this fits better a view where God is, strictly and literally, both outside of space and time. So this view doesn't really seem to fit very well as a view of God being strictly and literally everywhere. But there are other accounts of properties that might do better for an account of why God is strictly and literally everywhere. There are two other main contenders around. One is the view that there are imminent universals. Some people say Aristotle held this view, but certainly the more contemporary metaphysician David Armstrong held the view that there are universals and they are strictly and literally present where their instances are. So if you think about, let's say, an electron that has the feature of negative electric charge, negative electric charge could be a universal that the electron instantiates, and that universal would be wholly present where that electron is. Indeed, it would be wholly present wherever any electron is. So it would be in more than one place at once. That's getting closer to a view of what it might be like for God to be strictly and literally everywhere. So on the first view of properties or universals, something like, say, humanity, sometimes philosophers say exists in platonic heaven, which is just to say it, it's not really located anywhere in the world, but things in the world participate in it or it's instantiated in them or something like that. It's, it's kind of a mysterious relation, but somehow one and the same humanity gets to be instantiated in or present in some way in both you and in me. And on this other view, what do you call an imminent view of universals, humanity is wholly present where Joseph is, and it's also wholly present where Dale is. So it's not like physical objects being in space where they can't be in discontinuous spaces at once. Right. So then why not say that God is the being or the existence of things, that he would be wherever all those things are? Well, here we have to understand that Someone like David Armstrong, for example, didn't want to say that there is a universal that corresponds to every meaningful predicate in our language. He didn't want to say mm -hmm. there has to be a universal of red and blue and of, well, whatever. He didn't even want to say that there's a universal of humanity. He only wanted to countenance what he called uh, fundamental properties. We think about physics and the kinds of properties that physics uses in its explanations, you get a very short list. So these are supposed to be fundamental or natural properties. They carve nature at the joints. They don't carve it any old way. So the example that I gave before, negative electric charge, that should be on the short list. We should recognize a universal like that. And anything else that you might think uh, physics requires, he was happy to accept universals corresponding to those kinds of predicates. So what about being? Well, that would be very much an example of the predicate being doesn't have to correspond to a universal of being. So go back to the example of color. There are color predicates. So there's the predicate red, there's the predicate blue, and red is true of some things. The predicate red applies to some things, like some roses. But someone like David Armstrong would have said, well, that doesn't mean that there's a universal of redness. There's something about the microstructure of plants and the way they interact with human beings who perceive them that makes it true 
that we apply the predicate red to them. But that's not because there's a universal of redness. So if we can find other universals that already make it true that the predicate being applies to them, then we wouldn't need to postulate this additional entity of being as a universal. And indeed, it seems almost any other universal that you care to entertain would make it true that that thing is. Right. Whatever has positive charge is, whatever is omnipotent is, whatever is conscious is. So all of those things are already going to make it true that that thing, whatever it is, is. So then you're saying it wouldn't be necessary to bloat our ontology or our metaphysics with this particular property, being, or existence. Right. And so then, if we don't need that for metaphysics, then we don't need to say that that's the thing by which God is omnipresent. Right. That's the idea. And it's hard to think of another candidate universal that would apply to all the places and perhaps other things so that God was identical to the universal that applied to all of those. Dr. Jedwab, there's a crucial point in your paper where you make some interesting moves and you're going to argue against the claim that God is strictly speaking everywhere. You say there are two plausible principles and they each conflict with that idea that God is strictly everywhere. You call the first principle P1, every spatial substance is material. And then P2 is that no spatial substance is located at different regions at once. And then you say, quote, if either of these principles is correct, God is aspatial, end quote. So can you tell us why should we accept that every spatial substance is material and that no spatial substance is located at different regions at once? Well, first, let me say how, if these principles were true, they would show that God is strictly aspatial. I am assuming that God is immaterial, that God is not a physical being. So if you have the view that every spatial substance is material, but God is immaterial, it follows that God is not a spatial substance. Since God's a substance, it follows God's not spatial. God's aspatial. Likewise, no spatial substance is located at different regions at once. If God were a spatial substance, then God would be located at different regions at once because God would be strictly everywhere. So that means that he's not a spatial substance. So why should we think that these principles are true? Well, I have some arguments. I introduced this technical term that I borrow from a, another person called uh, Chris McDaniel, called this spatial geometrical topological and metrical features of a being its shape. So I think that regions have a shape. And plausibly, any substance that occupies or is located at that region inherits its shape from that region. So for example, if a region is spherical, closed, has one meter diameter, then anything that occupies that region is going to have all the same features because it's located or occupies that region. I wonder, Dr. Jedwab, if this is a strange sense of the phrase having a shape, because normally you would think that having a shape involves having boundaries. But think about a cube that's, I don't know, 10 meters across every direction and then there's a spherical area inside that cube, which is, uh, I don't know, one meter across. Think about the uh, spherical region, one meter in the middle of the cube. We don't usually think that the cube has that spherical shape, do we? Isn't that only a potential to be shaped that way? I mean, if we carved away the rest of the cube, we could end up with a spherical one meter across object, but... If you're dealing with a 10 by 10 by 10 cube, does it really have spherical shape? No, I don't think the cube has a spherical shape, but it may have a proper part that has the spherical shape. 
Okay. And so if God is thought to literally fill all of space, then you're saying that he would have a part which is shaped like, well, any shape you please. Well, in the case of God, God would be located at every region. So if there's a spherical region, God would be located at that spherical region and so would have the shape of a sphere. But of course, there is also some cubical region. And if God is strictly everywhere, God would be located there as well. And so God would also have a cubical shape. So at one and the same time, God would be having both a spherical and a cubical shape. Or rather having parts that have those shapes. Well, I also assume that God is simple. So God doesn't have parts. God would be wholly present in every region he's located at. I guess what I'm hung up on is that since, okay, so suppose he's simple but extended, but literally extended, has spatial extension, but, but that's all of space. And so I guess I'm hung up on that. There are no boundaries to his extension. And so it's not clear to me that he would have the shape of any subregion. He's never limited or locatable within that region in a way that he isn't in all the other regions. That's why I asked if this is a different sense of having a shape than we normally are talking about with three, three-dimensional objects. The more obvious way to think about how this is not the way we ordinarily think about shape is, like you said, shapes seem to have boundaries. But the way that I'm using the term shape here is something that occupies infinite space without any boundaries would still have a shape even if it didn't occupy any subregion of that region. Imagine a, an object that occupies only one region, which is an infinite region, and so it has no boundaries, but it still has a shape. You don't have to think that it occupies any subregion of that region, so it wouldn't have any other shapes. It would just have the one shape. The shape of a space that's infinite in all directions? Right. That seems like kind of seems to me like it's shapeless. Well, and maybe in some more familiar usage of that term, but it still has geometrical, topological, and metrical features. And that's all that I mean by it having a shape here. We tend to identify shape with some closed plane figure kind of shape or some closed three-dimensional shape like volume. Mm -hmm. But I'm not limiting myself to those cases. But the shape here is just simply occupying a certain quantity of a certain dimension. It doesn't presuppose anything about boundaries. Right. I'm not thinking of the regions as having boundaries necessarily, and I'm not thinking of the occupants of those regions as having boundaries necessarily. P1 says every spatial substance is material. Why well, think that's true? So I think that for a substance to be spatial, it has to be located at some region. The region will have geometrical, topological, metrical features. So in my technical sense, it will have a shape. The substance that's spatial that occupies that region will inherit its shape from that region. So again, if the region is spherical, the thing that occupies that region will also be spherical because it occupies that region. The final step is just this. It's to say shape is a physical feature. And anything that has a physical feature is a material substance, is a material being. So if God were to occupy every region, God would have a shape. God would have a physical feature, so God would be a material being. But I'm assuming God's immaterial, so God's aspatial.
That's the first principle. The second principle says no spatial substance is located at different regions at once. If God were in space, God would be located at different regions at once because God would be located at every region. And there's more than one region. So he would clearly be located at different regions at once. So why I think that, that principle is true? It seems to me that if God occupied a spherical shaped region and God occupied a cubical shaped region, God would have to both be spherical and cubical. But it seems to me that's just impossible. Just like it's impossible for something to be both round and square. So on the three dimensional level, I think it's impossible for something to be both spherical and cubical. So that's why I think that God can't be located at different regions at once. If God were spatial, though, he would be. So it follows that God is aspatial. So someone could come back at this point and say, well, why couldn't God be located at different regions at once? Why couldn't he have different shapes at once? So long as those shapes are indexed, involve relations to the different places. Somewhat similarly, when people are talking about the existence of a substance through time, they say, well, things have different properties at different times, but that's okay as long as these are indexed, involve relations to different times. Mm -hmm. I think the problem here with the spatial indexing is that a spatial substance has to have some shape or other because it occupies a region and inherits a shape from the region. But there has to be such a thing as the shape that it has in itself. I don't think I can make sense of the view of it just having shape relative to this place and relative to that place and relative to a third place. There has to be something about it which is its shape in itself, apart from all the relations that it has to other things. Dr. Jedwab, about your principle that every spatial substance is material, I wonder about the case of souls. So what if we decide to think that your soul is in control of your brain and not in control of my brain because your soul is in the same space as your brain, but then would it follow that your soul is material? Well, if my argument works, it does because the soul would be strictly located at some region that has a shape. It would inherit that shape. I think of shape as being a physical feature, and anything that has a physical feature is a material being. The way that I think about the soul is it can have a loose sense in which it is where your brain is, but strictly speaking, it's aspatial. Okay, so you're, you're, you're a little bit more near the camp of Descartes, in a sense, right? about souls. Yeah, I think you would have to be to be to consistently firm P1. So we've sailed some deep waters here. We've got into some really impenetrable subjects. And uh, I think you've penetrated them more than I have. But when we come to the final analysis, Dr. Jedwab, how should we understand the claim that God is everywhere? There's more than one way we can think of God being loosely everywhere. Here's just one. And here I'm following Aquinas. God, I assume, creates and sustains all else, including all places. So God stands in this intimate relation to every place. And that's enough, I think, to generate a loose sense in which God is everywhere. Even if not a strict sense, still a loose sense. Just as I think that a soul is an immaterial and aspatial being that is in a loose sense where the body is, perhaps in a different sense where the brain is because of the direct causal connection between the soul and the brain. So likewise, I think that there's this loose sense in which God is everywhere because of the direct causal connection God stands in to every place because he creates and sustains them. So here's an analogy to get you uh, going with this. Suppose my wife and I video call each other by phone. Each of us at the time sees and hears what the other does, and each of us converses with the other. Suppose that there's a, a friend of mine 
who's rather innocent to the marvels of technology and overhears me apparently speaking to someone. They might think that I'm crazy, right? Naturally concerned for my sanity, he asks, who are you talking to? And I say, to my wife. And my friend looks around and doesn't see anyone and says, where's your wife? And I point to the phone screen or the speaker and say, she's right here. It seems to me that in a loose sense, my wife is right here. That is where the phone screen or speaker is because of a, a peculiarly intimate relation that my wife bears to that phone at that moment, namely that there's some kind of causal relation going on. I can hear her voice here. I can see her image here because she's on the other end causing that voice and that image to be heard and seen. So that's something of an analogy of why it's appropriate to think that God is everywhere because God's intimately connected with every place. Namely, in his creating and sustaining every place and what is in every place. Right. Dr. Jedwab, thanks for talking with us. My pleasure. Thank you. This week's Thinking Music has been the track Nacht Wandel by Andy G. Cohen. You can listen to or download that whole track at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Do you enjoy listening to the Trinities podcast? There are four ways you can show us some love in return. First, share the blog post for this episode on whatever social media you use. Second, you can leave us a rating and a brief review in the iTunes store and at Stitcher. For step-by-step directions on how to do this, visit trinities.org slash blog slash review. Third, you can donate to the cause by clicking the orange donate buttons to the right of any blog post. Fourth, you can send us some brief to-the-point audio feedback for possible incorporation into a future episode. We would love to hear your question or your comment in your voice. The upload link for your audio file is on the blog post for any episode. To sum up, you can share rate, donate, and talk back. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.